do you know what Australian food is? For some people, even Australians, this can be a hard question to answer. Like America, Australia is filled with people from all over the world, and the food reflects this. You can find British meat pies, which I think we've claimed as our own, noodle soups from Thailand and Vietnam, Indian curries, and much, much more. So what is Australian food? Well, there is an easy answer to this question. Australian food is the food that's native to the land. The food that you can't find anywhere else. The food that grows right beneath Australians' feet. Have you ever tasted kangaroo? Or how about a yam daisy? Or a fruit called a kwandong? This was the food that the first people of Australia ate, long before Europeans arrived. Today, the first Australians are often called Aboriginal or Indigenous Australians. The word Aboriginal comes from a Latin word that means from the beginning. These pioneers lived and cared for the land for over 50,000 years. Today, about 500 different nations of Aboriginal people live across the continent of Australia and the island of Tasmania. The first people are an important part of the story I'm going to tell today. This is the story of Australia, its people, and the oldest food on the earth. historians, it's time for another incredible journey through time with Anytime Now. I'm Brooke, the co-founder of Honest History. Do you love food? I mean, who doesn't? In this episode, we're going to explore food from a continent on the other side of the world, Australia. But perhaps more importantly, we're going to discuss the story of the people behind native food from this amazing place. Have you ever paused while you were eating to think about where something on your plate came from or how a particular recipe, like lasagna, was first invented? Many times there's no concrete answer that points to a single person who created a dish. But almost every time, any particular dish can be traced to a place and time that was influenced by the culture and traditions of the people living there. Understanding how a group of people lived and the resources available to them will often give us a better idea of how recipes were born. We also often find that food we eat is a combination of different cultures who at one point in time came in contact with each other. Sometimes these encounters were friendly, but too often one group of people was hostile and intended to conquer the native population. This episode explores a story where an outside group of people came to Australia to take the land from the people living there and the unintended consequences it had on the food people from this continent still eat today. As you listen to this episode, think about some of the food you've eaten recently, then go out and do some research and try to find how that dish was created. We bet you'll be surprised by the answer. Now, Let's get into the story. Our story begins a very long time ago. It's a story that was told for thousands of years by the first people. In Aboriginal culture, this is called a Dreamtime story. It describes a time before time. At the beginning of time, in Dreamtime, the land was flat. There was no mountains or hills, no trees or rivers or lakes, no animals or birds. A huge serpent awoke. It had been resting under the earth. It is called the Rainbow Serpent. The Rainbow Serpent pushed through the earth's crust and slithered across the land. As it moved, it created deep tracks in the empty ground. The rainbow serpent called out to the frogs. They were beneath the earth, just as the serpent had been. The frogs came out and the rainbow serpent tickled their bellies, which made the frogs laugh. As they laughed, 
water poured out from the frog's mouth. The water filled up the deep tracks that the rainbow serpent had made. Now there were rivers and lakes. Slowly the water brought more life to the land. Grass began to grow. Then all the animals awoke. The kangaroos. The lizards. The birds. The koalas. And the dingoes. They all took their place on the earth. The story of the rainbow serpent has been told for thousands of years by the first people of Australia. Across the continent, the rainbow serpent has many different names in many different languages. The stories are not always the same, but many of these stories talk about a time when Australia was created. Did you know that Australia is the oldest continent in the world? Some of its land dates back 4.4 billion years. It is a huge country with many different climates, plants, animals and people. And as the oldest continent on the earth, it also has the oldest foods on the earth. If you travel to Western Australia, you will find the dry desert with its red orange coloured sand. Though there are not many plants, you may spy bush tomatoes growing on small shrubs. Bush tomatoes are a small bit of fruit whose growth is encouraged by fire and disturbance, suited to the harsh dry conditions of the desert. Kangaroos, wallabies, lizards and dingoes also walk across this dry hot land. At night, you can hear the howl of the dingoes. In the centre of Australia, you will find miles of flat land sprinkled with light green grass, shrubs and trees. Every once in a while, you will see hills bursting out of the flat grounds. The hills are made of rock and sometimes they are a reddish colour. Fruits like desert lime, ruby saltbush and quandong, which is a bright red fruit that tastes sweet, sour and salty, and the seeds are used to make jewellery, are grown here. Giant lizards like the parenti lizard live here too. This lizard can grow up to 6 feet long and run 20 miles an hour. As you travel east, the air will become more humid. You will find lakes and wetlands. And if you travel all the way to the ocean, you will find the blue-green waters of the Coral Sea. Not too far from the coast rests the Great Barrier Reef, filled with all kinds of creatures. Brightly coloured coral, blue tang fish, green sea turtles, snails and sea snakes. If you travel north, you will find tropical forests filled with green leaves, waterfalls and animals you can't find anywhere else in the world. There are ringtail possums, tree kangaroos, frogs and bright blue butterflies. In the tropical north, you can also find many different plants to eat. Boab, kakadu plum and pencil yams. As you travel south, the air gets cooler. This is where you will find many of the big cities, like Adelaide, Melbourne, and my favourite, my home, Sydney. But out in the country, you can find kangaroos and emus. Emus are those large brown coloured birds that can't fly, but man, they can run. You'll also find foods like finger lime, Davidson plum, and muntries. Muntries are a tiny apple looking fruit that tastes like a mix of apple and spicy bubblegum. For thousands of years, the first people of Australia learned about these lands. They worked with its seasons and harsh weather. They discovered the best ways to prepare foods, even the ones that could be poisonous. They set fires to burn plants that helped other plants grow. They cleared woodlands where they needed to. They planted the soil and harvested the crops. They fished the rivers and oceans and ate the mammals, bugs, birds and reptiles that lived around them. This was the Australia they understood, the Australia they created and managed for thousands of years. But this land changed. In 1770, a ship was spotted off the coast. It was the HMS Endeavour, a British ship sent to explore new lands. 
its captain, James Cook, decided to set anchor and go ashore. As the crew stepped off the ship and onto the white sandy beach, they were surprised by the land around them. Many of the plants had been cleared away and the trees were spread out from each other. One of the men on the ship reported, the country looked very pleasant and fertile, and the trees, quite free from underwood, appeared like plantations in a gentleman's park. Little did the men know, they were admiring the work of Australia's first people. The next few days, the men explored the country, tasting some of the local foods they found. We dined upon the stingray. We had it with a dish of leaves of tetragon boiled, Cook wrote in his journal. Tetragon is a native food known as Warrigal Greens. He said that the Warrigal Greens tasted a lot like spinach. The men of his crew ate this green leafy plant to stop them from getting scurvy. Scurvy is a type of illness people get when they don't eat enough fruits or vegetables. Cook and his crew liked the Warrigal Greens so much that they took the seeds of the plant back with them to England so they could grow it there. The first colonists also ate wild celery, duck, fish and oysters that they found. But there were many foods that Cook and his crew did not like. They thought that some tasted too sour. Others made them sick because they didn't know how to prepare them. It was not long before ships arrived from Europe carrying European foods and people. The colonists continued to taste the local foods. Sometimes they served them at dinner parties. In 1864, a local Australian newspaper printed a story about a dinner for the Acclimatisation Society. The society was made up of a group of people whose goal was to send European plants and animals to Australia so that Europeans could eat the foods from home. They also sent plants and animals from Australia back to Europe. At this dinner for the society, the chefs cooked up a huge meal. They served both Australian and European foods. There was filet de wombat, which was meat from the wombat. There was pâté de parakeet, a type of meat dish made from the liver of parrots. They also served kangaroo, magpie goose, black duck, and fish caught off Australia's coast. The dinner was a success. The food, delicious. The journalist wrote about the dinner with excitement. Australia had so many different foods to offer. With only a little bit of work and patience, the journalist wrote, these foods could be turned into incredible meals. This didn't happen. While some Europeans enjoyed the occasional Australian fruit or vegetable, most turned their back on the unfamiliar food. Instead, they tried to make Australia more like Europe. Shortly after they arrived, the colonists claimed the land for themselves. They cleared the trees to plant wheat and corn. They brought cows, horses and sheep. The land began to change. Plants did not grow as well as before. The soil became hard as more sheep, cows and people walked over it. When it rained, the water did not soak into the hard soil. Instead, the rain ran off the ground and into the rivers. The once gentle rivers became wild, filled with fast running water. The water from these rivers wore away at the land around it. Unlike the first people of Australia, the colonists did not work with the environment. They worked against it. The Australia we see today looks very different from the Australia the first people created many years ago. Even today, 200 years later, it is still hard to find shiny red corndogs or a bright green bush tomato in grocery stores and restaurants. But people are trying to change that. A lot of chefs are cooking with native ingredients in their restaurants. Australians are sharing recipes that use local food. People are trying to make it easier to get these native foods into Australian homes. And for the past 200 years, Aboriginal Australians have been fighting to keep their culture alive. Several years ago, researchers wanted to learn more about Aboriginal food. They asked the people about their way of life. One Aboriginal Australian said, our mothers had us in their bellies. They bore us. They grew us until we grew up. And they taught us about the bush foods. We ate as we went along, watching them and learning from them. They gathered what was in the bush and what was in the rainforest. They taught us. We didn't eat on our own, 
but what they pounded and chewed was then given to us, then we would eat. That was when we were still toddlers, up till when we started to learn how to walk. Then we were trained to eat on our own and see the bush foods on our own, whatever our mothers would have collected for the day. We learned from them as we watched them. Stop and think about where you live. What foods are native to that land? If you live in North America, it could be turkey, pumpkin, and cranberries. In South America, it could be chocolate and potatoes. In Africa, okra and black-eyed peas. You might be surprised by the things you discover. There is an important history in the land we live on and the foods that we eat. And try to remember, never ignore what grows beneath your feet. Well, I certainly know what I'll be searching for the next time I'm in the produce section. Guangdong sounds so interesting and I can't even imagine what they taste like, along with all the other tasty dishes eaten by the first people. Today's topic is so important because it teaches us not only about the history of food, but more importantly, prompts us to consider the history behind food. Sadly, this history is not always positive, but it's important to understand how we can commit to never making the same mistakes again. It's incredible to learn about the folks fighting to keep Aboriginal Australian cuisine alive, and even more incredible to know it's making a comeback in Australian cuisine today. That's all for this episode. But to learn more about different foods and culture, check out Honest History's book, History is Delicious, available everywhere books are sold. You'll learn about food from around the globe and about the people who created the food we all enjoy today. Plus, you'll even get to try a few tasty recipes from some very talented chefs. See you all next time. This episode was hosted by Pete Campbell and written by Heidi Coburn. Production was led by Randall Lawrence. To learn more about this episode, including more about the host, visit us at honesthistorymag.com and follow along for updates on social media at Honest History. <laughs>